Thank you. So good morning. Uh, last class we started talking about pandas, and uh, maybe I can do a quick review of what we did in pandas, and then we can take it from there. So we discussed on what pandas is. Uh, we discussed on uh, it, it's, it's it's a basic package for data analysis that we use with Python. We saw that pandas can do exploration, cleaning, and transformation, and it is built upon NumPy and SciPy. Uh, one, we highlighted the key features that come with pandas: so integrate indexing, the ability to do descriptive statistics, and a set of very useful functions that are used for data pre-processing and feature engineering, which are again key steps in doing our data analysis. We saw further that there are two basic data structures. We saw the series structure. We saw how to create a series, uh, how, what a series looks like, and how to access elements of the series, either using label-based uh, indexing or using index-based. We saw that we can combine series together to form something called as a data frame. We also saw that data frame is something like rows and columns that we uh, see and, uh, and use in Excel kind of structure. Further, we saw different ways of creating new columns. We saw some Boolean operations. We saw methods of removing columns and inserting columns based on, uh, you know, inserting columns in between and so on. And finally, we had come to the point where we were saying that we can read uh, elements from the data set. If we have a file, which is given in the comma separated values, CSV format, uh, Pandas provides a way where we can read the CSV format, uh, if we give the path into a data frame, and then we can use special uh, different specifiers that you know, help us to control uh, multiple things. And I, I think probably this is where we'll start today. Uh, we'll shift to our example and we'll take it from there. So, uh, do you have any questions from last class? Okay. Wait. Share my screen. These were the examples we were going through in code. And let me jump to the place where we were at that moment. Okay, so we were discussing about the, the movie lens data set and we said that we'll use this movie lens data set as a case study uh, to help us to see what pandas has and how we can use pandas in different cases. So let me just run a few commands so that we can load this. I have to first import pandas as pd. Now I can skip all of this, go down here and get the five movies. See movies head, uh, get the file tags, get the file ratings, delete the timestamp, see the ratings head, see the tags head, and see movies, tags, and ratings. Okay, so we'll wait for a few seconds for this to execute. Uh, among all these, so we saw we were looking at this movie lens data set, and here uh, the, we had three important uh, uh, data frames. We had the movies data frame. The movies data frame has these titles, has these features the movie ID, title, genres. Then we have tags data set, which has user ID, movie ID, tag, and timestamp. And then we have ratings, which is user ID, movie ID, rating and timestamp. Here, rating is, is somewhat a big file, and based on uh, because of which loading or doing operations on ratings takes some amount of time. Okay. We saw that uh, at this moment, when we are exploring, we are not using timestamp, so we deleted both uh, timestamps from the user I, from the ratings column, ratings data frame, and tags data frame. That is what we do here. And then this is what we left with. We also saw the size of uh, the different uh, uh, 
so the size of different uh, data sets. Uh, for movies, we have roughly 62,000 elements. For tags, we have roughly uh, this, which is 10,93,000 elements. And here we have some, you know, much more elements in the ratings data set. Okay. So just to review, I'll probably quickly share what is the correlation between these three data sets. So this is the data set movies, which gives us a link of, uh, or it gives us an idea of uh, the title of the movie. It also gives us the movie ID. It gives us within the title, it gives us uh, some idea of when the movie was created or when the movie is released. And then within genres, it tells us what is the genres of the movie. Okay. So like this, we have so many movies and for each movie, we have this information available. It's title, it's year within the title, and then the genre of the movie. Tags and ratings data set, they are uh, results of a survey that is conducted. So the survey generally, it comes from a website where different user IDs can tag different movie IDs with different uh, tags, okay? Specifying the genre of the movie. So multiple user ID users, they come, they take the movie, they say, okay, this movie I think is classic, this movie I think is sci-fi. Uh, user 4 comes to this movie, uh, 1732, and says, I think that uh, the 1732 movie is dark comedy, it has great dialogue, and so on. Similarly, these users also have a different data set where they are collecting the ratings they have given for the movie. So different people have different ratings assigned to the movie. And with this data, can we do something? So uh, first we look at something called as descriptive statistics. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is where we need to start. Let me. Let me show my screen. Okay. And we'll take it from here. So within pandas, we have a uh, very interesting function called as the describe function. Okay. And what describe function does is the describe function helps us see a lot of descriptive statistics at one go. Okay. So many of the times, uh, let's say here, as in when I take pd.series, uh, I'm creating a new series with three elements, two, three, and four. And this data, uh, this uh, data type, series data type, is stored in the variable s. Now s gives me an option of calling the describe function, which gives me the results of all of these basic statistics that can help me know more about the data. So it includes the count, that is how many elements are there in the series. So in this case, we have 23 elements. It gives us the mean value. So if I take an average of all these three numbers, what is the average I will get? So uh, since two, three, four, very obvious, we'll start, we'll get the average of three then it gives a standard deviation. So standard deviation is the measure of spread of the data from the mean value. How much is my spread? So here again, it's since with VJ with just three numbers, the answer is very obvious. Uh, we have a mean of three and we go one unit here and one unit here. It gives me that my standard deviation or my spread is around one unit, that is one. What is the minimum value? So the minimum value is two. What is that? So let me uh, come to these two points later. What is the minimum value? What is our middle value? Okay, our middle value is three. What is our max value? Our max value is four. Now, these two numbers, 75, uh, uh, actually all three numbers, we can discuss like this, 25 percentile, 50 percentile, and 75 percentile. So this is if uh, from minimum range to maximum range, what is the 25 percent jump that I can go to? So this 25% jump comes to 2.5. That is from here, this is the minimum value, this is the max value, this is the 50% value. Okay. So what is something in between? Something in between is 25, 2.5. And again, what is something in between three and four? That is 3.5. Okay. So when we do a dot describe, it gives us all these interesting descriptive statistics uh, that we can use to see how our data is distributed or what is the mean, what is our, uh, you know, uh, percentiles and so on. Okay. Along with these percentiles, I can do 
uh, I can find out individual values this way. If I use s.min, it gives me the minimum value. s.max gives the max value and so on. Okay. s.mode gives me the most common value. s.correlation is a C-O-R-R. -R. We'll see what correlation looks like and, and what the output is. Okay. So the describe function gives, helps me to see basic statistics about my data. Shift back to the screen. Let's see how this looks like. Okay. So here we take the ratings data and we will see for the ratings data within the ratings data set uh, or data frame, we have a column called as a ratings. Okay. So this column has these numbers. So these are the different ratings that the people have given for different user IDs have given for different movies. Okay. So if we take that ratings and we say, what is the count? Okay. So it says, okay, there are some 2.5 raised to seven numbers in this. That gives me the basically the length or it gives me the number of rows that is there in this data set. Okay. And for these number of rows, how many of them are available? That is this sum. So in this case, uh, even if we have a few missing, this number will not let us know because it's a very huge data set. It says, okay, what is the mean? If I take all these ratings together and calculate its mean, we come to 3.533854. Okay, so let's say we have 3.53. That is the mean of all the ratings together. What is standard deviation? So standard deviation is around 1.06. So 1.06 means from this mean, 1.06 ahead and 1.06 behind will capture most of the data or will capture, I think, uh, to be exact 95% of the data. I'll have to verify. Okay. Further, it gives me what is the minimum value. So the minimum value is 5 e raised to minus 1, which is 0.5. So users have given a minimum value of 0.5 at 25%. So let's, let's look at the max also. So our minimum is 0.5. Our max is 5. And our center point is 3.5. Okay. which says our 25 percentile is 3, our 75 percentile is 4. Okay. So for the ratings data, uh, for the ratings data frame, and within the ratings data frame, the ratings columns, gives us some interesting insight on how the data is distributed. Okay. At least how the ratings is distributed. Further, if you see, uh, instead of taking a feature within the ratings data frame, we can also take the entire rating data frame and call dot describe. So in this case, we are calling dot describe on a series object. Whereas in this case, we are calling dot describe on a data frame object. So this data frame has multiple uh, features. So if you look at ratings, it has user ID, movie ID and rating. So when we apply describe on the rating data frame, it applies it on or it gives us the descriptive statistics for all the three columns, for user ID, for movie ID, and for rating. In, in our case, user ID and movie ID, seeing the statistics on this does not make a lot of sense because uh, what is the mean value of ID or what is the mean value of movie ID uh, is not of statistical importance to us because we know that these ID are just unique identifiers for the user. And these numbers, even though they are numbers for user ID and movie ID, these numbers don't mean a lot. So user ID with ID one or a user ID with ID 10,000 uh, has no particular significant value in the number one and 10,000. They are just uh, identification given to those two. Hence, this descriptive statistics that we see here may not mean a lot. Okay? So we can focus only on the ratings here, but uh, this is just as a description. Uh, it gives us an idea that when we apply the dot describe, it will take all the so uh, another key thing is it will take all the numerical features and give us this numbers. So if I have an object feature, what is the mean value of an object? It does not make a lot of sense. For example, if I take the tags data set and I'll say for this tags, find me the minimum value or find me the maximum value or find the mean here or 50% quartile and so on. It does not make a lot of sense because this data is object, it's a string element. We have no concept of minimum of a string, maximum of a string and so on. Okay. Maybe we can discuss the length of the string, but again, in our in our case, that that uh, statistics does not make a lot of sense. Okay. So what describe does? It takes the numerical features 
and for those numerical features gives us these values okay and we should not keep this in mind when we are looking at ids these numbers don't mean a lot okay now apart from the describe we can individually call different uh, functions on the data so that this can return to us something which we can use as an input for something else so when we do the dot describe function it creates us a neat table and this is only for visual purpose i cannot remove this data and use it in a formula or something it, it i can only see this as an answer but if i really want to use this data into some formula or you know some uh, as a as a as a step in between that will be used later then i can use the individual function so in this case when i take a ratings uh, data frame and within that we see the rating series and we want to find its mean value we can do dot mean and here we get this number which is exactly what we find here as well we along with mean uh, ratings mean we can do it for individual we can do it for the entire data set also we can do ratings dot mean and that will give us this entire row we can find the minimum value of rating we can find its max value we can find a standard deviation we can find its mode so mode is the most commonly uh, most common uh, uh, value that is here so we see that the most common value that different people different users have given is a value of 4 then we have something called as correlation c o r r do any of you know what correlation is okay anyone wants to give it a go okay so sure so uh, correlation is basically when uh, we have features and we want to see how one feature is related with another feature okay so what is the correlation of one feature with the other feature that means uh, if we talk about one feature if this feature is increasing its value will the other feature also increase its value okay. or if one feature is increasing its value will the other feature actually reduce its value and that kind of idea that is uh, that kind of relation between multiple features is called as correlation okay so just to give you an example if we are talking about the price of a house and we are looking so price of a house is something that we are interested in and we look at two features we look at the square feet area of the house and we look at how far this house is from the railway station okay so we know that as the square feet area of the house increases the price of the house also increases okay so bigger the area more its price so we can say that this is, uh, the price uh, the square feet Uh, of the house is positively correlated with the price of the house as the square feet increases price will increase okay whereas when i look at the distance from the closest railway station okay the closer it is to the railway station the costlier the house will be the farther away it is people have to travel that much distance to reach to the railway station and that is one of the factors which would say that okay the farther it is from the railway station maybe the price will reduce okay so here we see that as the distance from the railway station increases for the house the price of the house reduces so we can say that they are negatively correlated okay this is just one example so along with positive and negative correlation we can also give a number as in how closely they are correlated okay so if i am correlated with a value of plus 1 uh, uh, and if i am correlated with a value of plus 0.5 Plus one has more correlation. Okay, so plus one has more correlation means, in fact, it has uh, the exact same rise in data as uh, the two features changes. Okay, so what correlation does is when we say ratings dot c o r r correlation, it will take each of the numerical features, and for those numerical features, it will give us a table and give us how they are related with one another. Okay, now in this case. the having user id and movie id this correlation again is meaningless okay because we know that ids have no particular uh, even if they give us a number they have no particular uh, uh, what do you say a relation between them okay or 
the relation between user ID and movie ID is simply random. Okay. So in either ways, when we look at this, uh, when we look at this table, how we will read this table is like this. We will say that user ID, as user ID moves by one unit, user ID also moves by one unit, which totally makes sense because user ID is the same is the same feature that we're looking at. Okay. So let's compare user ID with movie ID. It says that when user ID moves one unit, movie ID in fact moves in the opposite direction uh, and moves a unit of 0 0.004413. Now, this is very weak correlation. A very weak correlation because uh, one when one moves in one direction the other moves in the negative direction but with a very small value basically suggesting that user id and movie id are not correlated or their correlation is very close to zero ah this is the third value third thing that i uh, maybe did, did not discuss when two features have a correlation of zero it means that they are not dependent on each other so when they are not dependent on each other rise in one does not necessitate a rise or fall in the other one. Okay, it means that a rise in one is as good as a random uh, notation for the second feature. Okay, so here we can see that. Similarly, we see as user ID moves, rating moves in the positive direction with 0 0.0011. Again, this is also very weak correlation. Okay, this is as close to zero, basically suggesting that user ID has nothing to do with movie ID, and it has nothing to do with rating. So this is how you will read the first row. In same direction, you would read the second row. And you, if you observe this, the relation between movie ID and user ID is the same relation we have between user ID and movie ID. Okay. Movie ID, as movie ID moves, we move one in movie ID. As movie ID moves, so this uh, we move negative in ratings. So this is the relation between movie ID and ratings. And for the third one, again, you can see that the same numbers are being reviewed. So in fact, in when the correlation uh, in the correlation square, we are interested only in one set of the numbers. So you can uh, ignore uh, your diagonal matrix, your diagonal values, and everything above the diagonal values, and you can say, okay, only of interest here are these three numbers: one, two, and three. Okay. So for this square, this would be three numbers. For a bigger square, we would have more number of numbers uh, that are important to us. So this is what basic of correlation is uh, maybe when we come to examples uh, when we're using uh, working on titanic data set or other data sets we will see that there is more use of correlation and how we can use it so here we are just putting it just as a case of demonstration to show what we can do and what does it mean okay. now further we can also do some kind of boolean indexing here so when we look at the ratings data frame and within the ratings data frame, we look at the rating column. Or maybe moving ahead, before moving ahead, have all of you got what correlation is? Okay, great. Let me go ahead. Okay. So if I look at the ratings uh, data frame and within the ratings data frame, the rating column, and I put a criteria that do I have any of the values greater than five? Now, you would know the answer to this because when we did the describe function, we saw that the max value of the rating was five units. So we don't have anything greater than five. This is what the max tells us, okay? But let's say I do not have access to that and I want to find out specifically just to ensure that do I have any values greater than five? Okay. So when I put up this criteria, uh, uh, this criteria returns to me because this is a relational operator. What it will return to me is a Boolean series for each of the rows. Okay. And that is what we have in the, in the variable filter. When I print filter, I see that I see, I get a series of different false. Okay. Now, uh, since there are too many values within filter, I can see only the top five, the first five answers and the last five answers. But how can I say with certainty that all the answers that I have not seen in between, they have all answer as false. Okay. So here in this case, I can use the any function. If you remember uh, within NumPy, when we were looking at NumPy, we had seen two uh, functions which are important, the any function and the all function. Okay. In this case, we use the any function. The any function will return to us that 
are any of these values true okay so it goes through this entire list and it see when we say filter one dot any it returns to us false telling us with complete confirmation that none of the values in this entire range have a true value okay so we can be sure that our ratings is always less than or equal to five which is obvious because we did the describe and that is what we saw but what is the confirmation that uh, all of these values are greater than zero so do we have zero or negative rating so when we go through this it gives us series of trues and false if i want to know are all of them true i use filter to dot all and returns to us true saying that all these different values okay all of them are true for this criteria okay so that is some basic idea on on uh, using some descriptive statistics to help us know more about the data let's move to the next part where we're talking about uh, data cleaning so i will share my ipad so data cleaning is uh, a very very important step within our data science journey and if i have to just maybe uh, at this point also if i have to note down what are the things that we'll be doing with our data before we or in the entire project for uh, you know till machine learning and validation we will be looking at these steps okay we we'll do something called as the the exploration we have data pre processing we have something called as feature engineering okay. i have mistake it's fine feature engineering then we do something called as modeling the fifth step could be validation and testing and there between we can also do optimization so these are generic steps that people do work on on different data science problems okay and within data pre processing we come across something called as data cleaning and uh, this is very important because when we reach our step of modeling when we are trying to take different machine learning algorithms and we are trying to fit our data to those algorithms we will notice that these algorithms are very strict in certain aspects okay uh, one of the aspects that they are strict in is they do not they will not work or they will give errors if there are any missing values within our data okay so we should ensure within the data pre processing step that we don't have any missing values and one of the steps within pre processing is data cleaning where we will be handling with missing data and there are multiple strategies to handle with missing data uh, in our case right now we are just exploring some few features what pandas uh, provides us we are not we are not going deeply into data cleaning okay so even if you don't understand something it's fine in in fact i have not gone very deep here so it's, it, it it is kept very simple but once we have done pandas and matplotlib and before we go to our machine learning we'll have a class on data uh, pre processing steps okay so there we will see what are the different steps we do and what are the different ideas and skills that we need to employ okay. so at this point uh, data cleaning that we are doing with pandas involves some basic functions like the is null function what the is null function does it tells us that are there any missing values within a uh, feature or within the entire data frame also then we have any and all that we have already seen any cells are any of these values true all cells are all of these values true okay. then we have something called the drop na and the drop na function helps us to drop or helps us to delete all the rows which have any of the elements as not available or any of the elements having a missing value shown by na and within pandas okay. so these are some basic uh, 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 what do you say? Basic functions that we use with data cleaning. I'll share my screen. Okay. 
So let's start with exploring. Are there any missing values in any of the different columns that we saw? And if there are some missing values, let's look at a very basic way of dealing with them. Okay. So we start with movies and we see what are the columns here. So we do movies or column. We can see that we have movie ID, title and genres. Okay. So we can see what is its shape. So shape movies dot shape gives us an idea of how many rows are there and how many columns are there. So here we have 62,423 rows with three columns. Now there's another interesting feature uh, within Pandas called as the info. So when you do movies.info, it gives us some basic information regarding the movies data frame. Okay. So first it tells us that this date, this object that we have applied info on is a data frame object. What is its range index? That is how many rows are there? So it says, okay, there are these many rows and all these rows, they start from zero and go to these many rows. So it just gives us an idea of what is the number of rows we have and what is the index that we use for these rows. Then it tells us that this data has three columns okay? and it gives us a table which gives us something about each of the columns. So there are column movie ID, title and genres. It also tells how many non-null objects are there. Non-null objects means how many values are there which do not have not a number. So here we, we see that shape, shape told us that there are these many objects. And if you look at the columns, we can see for each of the columns, we have these many non-null objects. So we know that there are no null values within movies. We can also see count here. Uh, it says non-null count. Okay, so these, all of these are non-null values. Then it gives us the D type. That is the data type of each of the different features. It says that the movie ID is an integer variable. It says title, it says title is an object that is the string object, string variable and genres is also an object. It also gives us uh, that uh, how many data types we have. So we have uh, in one feature as integer uh, data type and we have two features as object and it gives us how much memory it took to load the state. Okay. So whenever we do dot info, it gives us all of this basic information regarding the data frame. Okay. Now we want to know are any of them Null. Okay, so we take the movies and through this entire data frame, we apply dot is null. That gives us that uh, it gives us the list of true and false for each of the uh, uh, movies data. Okay, and this true and false gives us an indication of uh, are there any missing values. And to this output, okay, we apply dot any, which says that of all the different movie IDs. Uh, and all of them having false or true, are any of them having the value? Just, just give me one second, okay? Uh, I'll just jump back. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay, and back. Okay, so we were discussing that uh, the is null function gives us an idea of are there any null values within the data set. And to this null, to the answer of is null, when we apply dot any, it gives us an idea of uh, are any of them true. Okay. So here we see that all of them are false, saying that there are no missing values within the movies data set. Okay. So let's look at the, let's look at the same numbers for ratings and tags. When we look at for ratings, we can see the shape of ratings is this much, and we apply for the ratings function. Uh, for ratings, we apply ratings dot is null dot, dot any, and we see false, false, and false. That means even the ratings uh, data frame does not have any missing values. Let's look at tags. So when we say tags dot shape, it says okay, there are these many values in tags, 
and tags.isnull.any gives us false, false, and true. That means there are certain tags or certain rows within the tags data which are uh, coming, giving us true. It means it has some missing values. Now, the next question we can ask is how many missing values? Okay. So if you look at the tags.isnull and you do a dot sum on this, okay, it will add all the places where it found true. So in this case, it found 16 places where it will true. Okay. And uh, it gives us that when you sum all these 16 values, uh, you know, I, I, we sum up all these trues, it gives us 16, and we know that there are 16 missing values. Maybe I can just quickly show you what is the output of tags.isnull. So when I see tags.isnull and execute this, so it gives us a series of trues and false for each of the different uh, row and column. Okay. And when you do dot sum over this, when you do dot sum over this, each of these rows are added up together. Okay. And if you have any one as true, it will count as many trues are there as you know one, two, three, and so on. So here there are no trues, that is why we get here zero. Here again, there are no trues, that is why we get zero. And here we have 16 different uh, uh, rows which have the value one, which have the value true. And adding those gives us the value 16. Okay. So that is what the sum indicates. Now, an interesting question to ask would be. Okay, which are those 16 rows? So we can do that or we can search that using Boolean indexing. Okay. So we saw that tags tag.isnull gives us a series of trues and false. When I pass this, uh, when I pass this to the tags uh, data frame and I say, okay, give me the result of this. So what it will do is wherever it finds true in any of the columns, it will return to us those values. So when we execute this, it gives us this answer. So we can see that for user ID 121710, for movie ID 33826, we have a tag of NAN that we that this user ID either did not record this tag or it got lost within the data or something has happened. But at this point of time, when I look at the data set that I have, this has a missing value. Then we can see for this user. So if you see all the other 15 values is for the same user. Okay. So probably uh, either the user did not populate this or it was lost within uh, some reason or some, you know, maybe in transfer or something it got deleted or someone has manipulated this data. There can be hundreds of different reasons why we don't have a value here. But we see that only for these two users and for these movies, we do not have a tag. Okay. And they are missing. So uh, this is how we can know if there are any missing values. Now, if we know there are missing values, what do we do with it? One simple way or one thing that we can do is we can delete these rows. So once we delete these rows, then uh, we will have no missing values and our algorithm would not throw us an error. Okay. One way to do that is to, one way to delete these rows is, uh, let's say now we have access to these column numbers also, we could do something else. We can do either delete or we can do pop. That is one option. But pandas gives us a very interesting function called as a drop any, which will uh, automatically go through all of the missing values. And for those missing values, delete all rows. Okay. So when we see tags dot drop any, and after doing that, we store the answer within tags again. So we are updating tags with a new data frame, which does not have missing values. And then when we see tags dot is null dot any, we see false, false, false. That means now we don't have any missing values. Okay. When we look at a shape, we can see the shape has now become one zero nine three three four four rows with three columns. And earlier, if you see, this was one zero nine three three six zero. So from six zero, we have come to four four. It means we have removed 16 rows from this tag data set, which makes sense because we had 16 missing values. When we do a drop any, those 16 rows will get will be, will be dropped and will not have them anymore. Uh, I hope this makes sense, right? Do you have any questions so far? No, okay, great. So let me just see this. Okay, we'll look at the next step, which is data visualization. Um, 
Okay. Then uh, within pandas, we can do a lot of data visualization. Okay. We can see different kind of plots. So maybe can, can you look at these plots and tell me what are these kinds of plots? So what kind of a plot is this one? Any ideas? It is a bar chart. Ah, okay. 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 Uh, then what is this one? It's bar. Yes. Bar. Yeah. So this, the first one is not a bar chart. Uh, it looks like a bar chart because we have bars, but uh, we have a special name for this chart. Does anyone know what the name for this chart is? Okay. What about this one? Oh, okay. <laughs> so these are new plots. Huh? Let, let me then just note them down. Okay. The first plot that we see here is, the, uh, yeah, of course it's made up of bars, but the special name for this chart is called as histogram. And for this chart, it is something called as a box plot. And this is our standard bar chart. Okay. So what the histogram does is it gives us an idea of the frequency of the elements. Okay. So here we are showing that there are three different kind of objects or elements. We have A, we have B, we have C. And for let's say C, when I look at this number when I look at zeroth value if the value zero is repeated somewhere 400 times uh, for the object C it is repeated roughly 275 times for object B it is repeated for roughly 110 times for object A and so on so the histogram gives us an idea of frequency of a repetition and whereas a bar chart here uh, says that uh, value A has a number of 10, okay? Now this number of 10, value of 10, need not necessarily be repetition, need not be frequency. It can be any value that it is trying to describe, okay? This value may say, what is the price of object A, or it may say, what is the, you know, depending on what data we are looking at, uh, we can see what magnitude it goes to for A, B, and C at different uh, values. Okay? Whereas a box plot gives us an idea of what is the range of distribution, okay? So here, uh, this box plot, let's say for 2013, says that I have a minimum value at this point, I have a max value at this point, and uh, my I have a mil middle value at this point. Okay. Then if I look at the 25 percentile, I have this as the 25 percentile, I have this as the 75 percentile. Okay. Another plot that uh, people who trade with stocks would be familiar with would be something called as candle bars. So we have candle bars like this that gives us an idea of how our stock is trading. Okay. So this may be uh, a red color candle bar or it may be a green color candle bar or a blue color candle bar depending upon how you set your uh, uh, your trading symbol to describe it. Okay. A blue bar tells me that on this day the market went up or a red bar tells me on this day the market came down. The this part and this part tells me the opening price and the close price. Whereas this tag here tells me after opening here, it went to a minimum of this value. And this uh, is called a wick. Okay. The upper wick and the lower wick gives me an idea of how far it went down, how far it went up. And similarly, a red bar says that it opened here and it closed here. So this was a negative bar and opening, closing, uh, high value and low value and so on. Okay. So these are different plots that we have access to. And when we use pandas, we can get access to some of these plots. Okay. So pandas is not a plotting platform. Pandas is a data pre-processing, cleaning, transformation platform. Okay. But pandas is built on one more package called as something called matplotlib. Okay. And matplotlib is a visualization platform. Okay. Or is a visualization package. So because of close ties between pandas and matplotlib within pandas itself, I can do some of the visualization features that are required for my data analysis. Maybe not all of them, but some basic features we can use 
from pandas itself that gives us an idea or that will help us in our exploration purposes okay so let us shift to uh, the screen so we can see how that looks like so if i look if i look at the ratings data and for the ratings data frame and within the ratings data frame the rating feature and if i do a value count dot value count what that does is it will see that this rating data how many times we have different values multiple uh, different values repeated okay so we know for the rating data that our data goes from 0.5 till 5 uh, but how many instances of 0.5 are there okay so here it says for 0.5 i have these many instances okay so 393068 people have have given a rating of 0.5 to all of the different movies there okay these many people have given a rating of 1.5 these many people have getting a, given a rating of 1 2.5 2 4.5 3.5 5 3, 5, 3, 5 and 4 okay these are different ratings that people have given okay so you see that what value counts does is it works on object or it works on categorical data okay so categorical data means here there, there are different categories of ratings that are allowed the categories are 0.5 to 5 in gaps of 0.5 and for each of these category how many elements are there okay so we also see that this data is sorted in the descending order of frequency that is the most frequent number is 4 which also makes sense because earlier if you remember we have when we had done dot mode on the ratings we had seen that the mode of the ratings was poor and now we have proof for it that this is the most common information okay out of all the data uh, it is repeated 66 lakhs 39000 times and that is why this is the mode of the data okay and we get this order now even though this is useful i can see this numbers and i can i can i can see what is happening but it is very difficult for me to understand the pattern shown with this numbers if i can see this in a plot then that would make so much more sense okay so uh, here we can call a histogram function so uh, i am calling this line here matplotlib inline and uh, it starts with the percentage percentage matplotlib inline and what this line allows me to do is whenever i use a matplotlib command to plot some image that image will be shown in line that is it will be shown within my jupyter notebook itself okay and that is what this line allows me to do okay so here in the next line here ratings so here generally what you can do is you can take this line and you can put it somewhere in the beginning of the code okay i have put it here just uh, you know just to show the importance i wanted to talk about it at this point and not in the initially but generally when we are doing a project we will do all imports in the beginning and when we are doing a import for matplotlib we will write this line as well okay so in our case ah uh, yes anand you are asking something ah uh, yes uh, is this line is called as a magic function uh yeah, I, i don't know what it is called but uh, you may call it a magic function so uh, these lines specifically specifically that starts with percentage are not part of your python code these lines are special instructions given to jupyter notebook okay so probably for that reason you, it may be called apart you know, from inline is there any other options for matplotlib uh, no not for matplotlib it is matplotlib. always the same yes it is always the same in the sense that you, if you want your plot to come within jupyter notebook we put this line if you don't put this line and let's say you are running your kernel in spider or something like that you will see that when you run this command you will get pop a different up. pop up yeah. and in that pop up you will have the image okay but generally in notebooks we want everything to be in notebook so when you put this line there are it will not come as a pop up but it will come in the notebook okay, okay. apart from this uh, this percentage is used to see if you see, if you remember earlier we had seen the ls command and uh, that will list the oh, files list, yeah. and before the ls command also we had put a but that we use exclamatory mark right was it what is exclamatory okay maybe i i don't know if we just if we see ah yes that is exclamatory so there may be other reasons then yeah we before something called as time it command we use uh, this so ah, but, uh, yes 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 if i'm I taking use. a cell and so these are uh, i think these are jupyter specific functions 
or Jupyter specific commands. These are not part of your Python code. That is why you put a percentage in front of it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, anyways, going ahead, when we call uh, the dot hist function, so on ratings data frame, when we call dot hist, this will give a histogram. Okay. And we are given certain specification what we want. We are saying that we want a histogram for the column rating. Okay. So, this is the entire data frame. Within this data frame, we want to find a histogram for the rating. And this will be the figure size. So, figure size here says, I want 10 units of x axis and five units of y axis. So, you can see that our x axis is roughly uh, twice the size of our y axis. Okay? So, this is, gives us an idea of how we can control the size of the size of the image. When we execute this command, we see this histogram. Okay. So, Maybe let me uh, take a small quiz. Uh, which is the most common uh, object here? Which is the most common answer for ratings? Uh, four. Excellent. Which is the least common? One. Nah, no. So this is this one represents point five. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is so 0.5 or 1.5. We can say are similar values, very low values, and so on. Okay. So when you look at this data, uh, do you see dips in the data? Do you see dips in the distribution of the data? So maybe I can say this. I can see a dip here, 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 and here. Okay. So I don't see a normal rising or a normal falling, but we see different dips. Can someone try and explain why do we see these dips? So data analysis, uh, maybe I, I can give you a hint. Uh, data analysis is not just about coding and getting information. A major part of data analysis includes trying to understand what these plots are trying to talk to us. Okay, so that we can get some more insight into what is being shown. Okay. So every time we draw a plot, it makes sense to give some time on the data on plot and try to figure out what it is trying to tell us. Okay. So that, that is why I'm just going to the step of asking these questions. Can you, can you probably guess why do we have dips here? I think uh, because of data categorization, mm -hmm. like okay. one, two, three, four. Like that. Okay. So you're saying because we have divided them into categories for some reason we have these dips. Okay. And any other answers? Okay, so maybe I, I'll give my take on this. Uh, so when you look at these numbers, we see that rating one, two, three, four, and five are relatively having higher number of frequencies than ratings 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, 4.5. 5. Probably because humans, when giving ratings, are more biased towards whole numbers or integers rather than floating numbers. So if someone asks me how the movie was, I would probably give rating of three over five rather than 3.5. So we don't like to think in terms of 0.5. And that could be few reasons why I do, why, why we have, we see these dips with, with, with these 0.5 repetitions. Of course, there are many people who would prefer to give 3.5, 4.5 and so on, depending on how mathematically accurate they are in describing a movie or giving the rating for a movie. But most people would prefer to give whole numbers, okay, rather than giving these numbers. So we see some, some, what do you say, human behavior coming into the data that gives us some description what is happening. Okay. Uh, that is my take on it. Uh, maybe wrong, maybe right. Uh, the thing is, we are left with this plot and uh, it is our, it, you know, it is up to the data scientist, up to the data analyst to analyze and to come up with reasoning for why we are seeing these answers. Okay. Uh, someone else would come up with different answers. And th there is, at this point, there is no way of knowing what is right, what is wrong. These are very subjective decisions. Okay. But the whole idea is, as we are progressing in our journey of data science, we need to learn to come up with our own insights. That when we look at some plots or we look at some figures, we try to figure out why it is happening. And this process of answering why it is happening 
will help us to design algorithms that can capture this Y or capture this pattern and then use this pattern to predict for unknown regions. Okay. So this is again, it's, it's a habit we have to inculcate. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead. So this is what, a, this is what the ratings uh, histogram tells me. So this information, if you notice, is more significant than this information that we have. Okay, so this numbers gives me numbers. It gives me absolute values, but they do not give me insight. Whereas when I look at this plot, this plot gives me insight. So we have just, you know, just seen a basic step of visualization that what visualization can achieve. Okay, just by representing the, the data into different kinds of plots can reveal to us more insights about the raw data than looking at its direct value. Okay. So let's say we look at a different plot, the box plot. And what the box plot does is it gives me apart from, so here you see the, the focus of box plot is not to give me the frequency of how these elements have been repeated, but the focus of box plot is to help me identify what is the distribution of data. Okay. How is my data distributed for ratings? So we have done, we have taken the ratings data set or the ratings data set we are calling dot blocks plot. So, okay, maybe one more thing if you have not noticed here is when you run this line, it gives us this, this neat output. Okay. So when you look at this output, we can say that it is returning to us an array and this is a multi-dimensional array because this is a, this is a list of lists and the object here is a matplotlib object. Okay. So this axis here comes from matplotlib. So now we can know for sure that this plot that we are getting, uh, pandas has not coded this plot. In fact, pandas in the background, uh, by calling this histogram function, is calling a matplotlib object to get this answer. Okay. Uh, similarly, box plot also, we see this matplotlib object. Our box plot looks like this. It gives us, uh, you see these two dots, these two dots represent outliers or this is what box plot thinks. Pandas thinks that these are outliers. Outliers means there is less representation of this data to consider it part of this entire group, which we also see here. You see 0.5 and 1.5 has comparatively less data than all of these numbers. So what uh, pandas thinks is pandas thinks that this is an outlier in which it represents using these dots that says that I have some data here at 0.5 we have some data here at one, but these are uh, relatively um, less number of data compared to this. Okay. And it says most of our data is distributed from 1.5 till five. Okay. And in this distribution, it says this line represents minimum value. This line represents maximum value. This line represents middle value. Okay. This is the most, uh, what is the mean value? So if you remember our mean value was 3.53, it is around this mean values around that point. Okay. Addition is box plot. Then we have the 25 percent percentile and the 75 percentile. So the 25 percentile is at three, a 75 percentile is at four. So a box plot helps us to see the distribution of data, and uh, the histogram helps us to see the frequency of uh, repetition. Okay. Yeah. So uh, remaining we have slicing. Okay, maybe we can finish this part also. So here we are just looking at the top six objects in tags. And if we see dot head again, it gives us the top five objects. Okay, let me see the point here. Okay, so all of this is just trying to access different data. If you look at tags, okay, let, let, let me focus on this point. Okay. So if you look at the tags data set and for the tags data set within the tags data set, the tag feature, if you do a value counts on that and after getting the value counts, that gives us the tags count. Okay. Maybe let me divide uh, this into multiple parts. And if we just show what tag counts look, we see that tag counts gives us all of these numbers. Okay. So here we have uh, different people who have given tags. The most frequent answer is sci-fi and 8,330 times we have got sci-fi. Okay. Then followed by atmospheric, which is uh, 6,516 times. So these are different tags that people have given. Okay. 
and we have multiple values here. So tag counts by default gives us the top five values and the bottom five values. Okay, so very few people have sent uh, given the tag sound effects. Some people have given this tag, which is not in English. I think in some different language, someone has given a tag and so on. Okay, so if I want to see uh, the top 10, I can take tags count, use it as a list and provide the slice of top 10 and print that. So this gives me top 10 repetitions. If I see minus 10, it gives me the bottom 10 repetitions. Okay, so these are uh, some values of tag counts that we have. It gives us how it is distributed. Again, uh, this distribution does not help me a lot. If I want to see visually, this distribution can be shown using a bar chart. Okay, so when we say tag counts, so this is the top 10 values. Tag counts, we do a dot plot. And within dot plot, we describe what is the kind of plot we want. Here we are saying that we want a bar chart by saying that the kind of plot we want is bar. Pick size just tells me what is the what is the figure size. And when you look at this plot, it gives us a neat figure that okay, sci-fi is uh, some eight thousand plus times people have given sci-fi, then atmospheric action, and so on. And this is the relation between the different repetitions of uh, the different tags that people have given. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can we can stop here. Uh, next class we'll talk about filters, groups, merge. This will probably probably be the last or the second last point within Pandas. And then we can go to the next topic. So maybe next class we can also continue uh, our exploration on Matplotlib. Uh, I can show you what the assignment looks like. So I have loaded the assignment uh, on Google Cloud, uh, sorry, Google Classroom. Once you download the zip, you should see uh, two files within that. You should see Pandas, 100 pandas puzzles.ipynd and 100 pandas puzzles with solutions. So here we have questions, 100 examples. Again, something like what we did for NumPy. You've got easy examples and slowly the complexity goes on increasing. And these examples can do multiple tasks. Okay, you can, you can come to know more features that we have not talked about in our class. Uh, in our class, we focus on the more, most important or most commonly used features. But while solving this, you may come across more answers as well. Okay. So these are the questions. And when you look at with solutions, these are the questions with solutions. So you can use this as a reference to explore the different pandas features. So I would strongly suggest that try some of these out. It will give us more ideas on how pandas can be used in different ways. And uh, many cases, so uh, as, as I said, within, within Python, as we by using it as a language, we hardly need to program a lot. Okay. So generally for doing each of the different, different tasks, there are many inbuilt functions. The more inbuilt functions you are having access to, uh, the easier your programming journey will be within Python. Okay. So again, at the same time, do not populate so many functions that you lose sight of, uh, uh, you know, what is happening where. So slowly with over time, I would say that over time are, 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 a knowledge of these functions. So like here, this is the first time I'm seeing n largest value pair. Okay. Most cases I would, I would do something else to get this answer. But if I know this, that would make my job a little bit easier. And if I'm using pandas frequently, uh, most common functions you will come across multiple times. Uh, many of the functions that are most common I've included within the class, within the lecture, but there are many other things that we can get from here. So I would suggest to go through this, go through these questions, uh, try to solve many of them as many as possible. And that will give you more familiarity with how pandas works out. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions before we close the class? Okay. Okay. So then we'll meet day after tomorrow. Uh, uh, I will upload the lecture on a classroom. I'll even uh, probably you'll get an email notification as well. And okay then, see you guys. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.